kids. Remember how when you were little, you always wanted a neck, Uncle? No. Well, now you got one! <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 worst Family Guy episodes. I'm sorry, I was just coming down the stairs at the same time. For this list, we're looking at episodes of the long-running show that have fallen flat for their fans over the years. Spoilers will be mentioned, so this is your official warning. Which episode of Family Guy do you think deserves to be on this list? Let us know in the comments below. Hey Mojoholics! For a chance to win cash prizes, play our live daily trivia challenges every day at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern only at watchmojo.com slash play. Number 20. Cutaway Land Cutaway scenes may be one of the most iconic aspects of Family Guy, and have been a staple of the show since the first season. So you'd think a whole episode centered around the Griffins stuck in a world entirely composed of those scenes would be nostalgic and hilarious all at once. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. B, as in, by God, that's Robert Loggia. Oh God, there are reruns in Cutaway Land. I remember this one, it takes a while. While some classic jokes are included, it isn't enough to make up for the lack of plot. The show seems content for the family to bounce from scene to scene, with not much logic to back it up. The real kicker is when it's revealed that it was all just a dream, a trope that had already grown stale by the time this aired. We were so worried. I wasn't that worried. Number 19, Vestigial Peter. Oh my god, it's a little me. Well, it looks as if he's more fully formed than we thought. Wow, your wife is gorgeous. Is that a foot? Almost. This is awesome! After Peter discovers a vestigial twin in his neck, he decides to befriend it. He grows weary of his new brother quickly and opts to have him surgically removed. Afterwards, the rest of the Griffins insist the twins stay, and he proceeds to take over as the head of the family. I wear those good old-fashioned values on which we used to rely. What the what the hell is going on here? While this concept seems interesting at first, Chip, the twin in question, becomes annoying almost immediately. Between his constant positivity and grating high-pitched voice, it quickly becomes apparent why Peter wants to kick him out. Hey, Peter! What's that? Oh, he's gonna turn you into a pile on Joe's lawn. What? Here, let's play steak catch. Oh, boy, I got it! Beyond Chip's characterization, the plot itself ends up being predictable in one note. If that were stronger, then the depiction may not be so irritating. But all it does is exacerbate the negative aspects. Number 18, Quagmire's Mom. Quagmire is interesting. Despite having hilarious moments, he's also a well-established creep. When he's caught with a teenager, it seems that he'll finally face consequences for his actions. That is, until his mother makes a sudden appearance. Your Honor, as the defendant's mother, I ask that you show mercy on him. Well, as the victim's mother, I ask that you go to hell. Where is your daughter? Show her to us! She confirms that he's only this way because she was promiscuous when he was a child. Not exactly the most airtight defense. Right as he and the viewers accept his sentence, the judge makes a last-second decision to rescind it, due to the inappropriate relations Quagmire's mother had with him. So, to sum it all up, Quagmire commits a horrible crime and then gets to walk away scot-free. Even Peter points out how ridiculous the circumstances are, and people at home cannot help but agree with him. Ah, oh, Quagmire got away with it and learned nothing. That's great. Number 17, Brian's a bad father. Hey, Dad. I know we haven't talked in a while, but I'm calling because I'm on my way to Quahog. Yes, we know it's the name of the episode. Yes, we know eventually Brian and his estranged son Dylan make up, but the lead-up to all this is so cringe-inducing, so forced, that the ends hardly justify the means. You're a terrible father. I never want to see you again! Brian even uses Stewie to apologize for him when Dylan demands space from his father. All this after Brian used the son he never wanted to further his writing career. Meanwhile, the typically wacky antics of Peter and his friends are replaced by arguing, betrayal, and shooting each other in the face. This episode really knows how real-life, relatable families and friendships work. Number 16, Brian Griffin's House of Pain. Where do we begin on this bowling ball-sized ball drop? Possibly with the B story, which explores the incredibly irresponsible sides of Chris and Meg. In this episode, they accidentally push their little brother down the stairs, causing a massive head wound. Instead of bringing their injured sibling to the hospital, they cover it up for weeks. 
When Peter finds out, he informs them this is a regular occurrence and even helps them blame Lois for the whole ordeal. When you were babies, I used to knock you kids out every month or so. Yeah, it's as bad as it sounds, and the A story's no better either. Truly a disappointing episode. Number 15, Peter Problems. After being promoted to forklift operator at the brewery, Peter immediately takes advantage of his new position and uses the machinery around town until he's eventually fired. Afterwards, Lois becomes the breadwinner, and he becomes impotent as a result. Well, somebody's gotta have sex with me. Lois, don't say that. Quagmire will show up like the roadrunner. He instantly becomes a caricature of a house husband, complete with a personality change. The portrayal of stay-at-home dads as weak and incompetent did not sit well with viewers. Beyond that, it also contains one of the most infamous scenes in the show's history. Peter attempts to use the forklift to help a beached whale, only to immediately eviscerate it instead. The brutal scene stands out among the weak story, and it becomes the standout moment for all the wrong reasons. Your whale come! <laughs> oh, cool shell! Number 14, Con Eris. This show is no stranger to stretching out bits to an uncomfortable extent, but Con Eris takes it to a whole new level. That's Margaret Woolworth, Carrington Von Schumacher, Chanel Astor, Livingston, Comte de Saint Exupery, Mountbatten, Windsor, Armani, Roosevelt, Von Trapp, Wickenham, Hearst, Montgomery, Rothschild, Johnson & Johnson, Twillsworth, Dolce Gabbana. Brian, Stewie, and Quagmire fight for the inheritance of an elderly heiress, whose name is so long that it takes nearly a minute to say. The payoff is minimal, and to make things worse, it's repeated several times. Happy birthday, dear Margaret Woolworth, Carrington, Von Schumacher, Chanel, Astor, Livingston, Comte de Saint, Exuper, I'm bad. I'm uh, just gonna hang here for a minute. The subplot isn't any better. Peter and Chris essentially fight for Herbert's attention after he mistakes the older Griffin as another teenager. Between that and Herbert's unnecessary song, it's apparent that they were just trying to fulfill the time requirement. Torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. Loving both of you is breaking all the rules. It's a creepy B story and is only a brief reprieve from the draining main plot. Number 13, Excellence in Broadcasting. Throughout the first few seasons, Brian is portrayed as a liberal with progressive ideas. He even fights for the legalization of same-gender marriage and marijuana, and fans respected that he was consistent. All that went out the window when Excellence in Broadcasting aired. After Rush Limbaugh makes a surprise visit to Quahog, Brian wants to heckle him, but instead ends up becoming a fan. Oh my god! Rush Limbaugh was right all along. Conservative republicanism is the answer. Good. Good for Brian. This is already wildly out of character, but it's made even worse when he blindly agrees with everything the controversial host says. He even sings about the wonders of being a Republican. I dream of Republican town, the place where the happiest smile is Cheney's frown. I'll bet you a buck you won't find a damn thing wrong, cause when you come down to it, this is where we all belong. It's a complete 180 to the character they had built up until this point and they never go back. Brian has been a contrarian ever since. Number 12, April in Quahog. He mistreats his kids, makes fun of his wife, treats his friends like trash, destroys the town every chance he gets, etc., etc. Listen, we know Peter Griffin is designed to be a mean character. However, deep down, he's always seemingly loved his family and would do anything to protect them, or so we thought. All that is tarnished in this episode when he admits that he in fact hates spending time with his children. I just hate being around the kids. What? So much for the idiot with a heart of gold. Don't worry, he buys the kids love back with an Xbox. Oh, and they bring back Surfin' Bird again. Hilarious. Number 11, Trump Guy. Donald Trump's presidency provided plenty of material for comedy writers, and Family Guy decided to throw their hat in the ring. After Peter secures a job in his cabinet, the Griffins decide to move to Washington, D.C., where Meg is assaulted by Trump. Many feel that while using Trump and his time in office was fair game, using his lewd allegations as fodder for jokes is crossing the line. Mr. President, please, I'm not interested. You'll regret this. Mother Matilda. <laughs> Afterwards, Peter fights him 
However, it's nearly indistinguishable from his brawls with the giant chicken. The only aspect that sets it apart from other duels is the fact that it takes place in DC. Sarah, any update? I haven't had the chance to ask the president if he's fighting with Peter Griffin. While the plot is ambitious, it's clear the show bit off more than it could chew. Number 10. You Can't Handle the Booth This show is no stranger to meta jokes, but they still took a risk by stretching one out across 20 minutes. This is bull crap. I'm calling Fox or Disney payroll right now. Fox or Disney payroll. Yeah, hi, this is Lois Please hold. Uh, of course. While recording commentary for a fictional episode, things devolve as Peter and Lois reveal past partners and pay disparities. However, viewers found it hard to care about the fight due to the couple having relationship-ending arguments weekly. Not being able to see any of the action hinders the quality of the story, and the format grows old early on. At one point, they even have the voice actors talk to the characters. However, it just comes across as a way to easily resolve the earlier fight, and the resolution feels unearned. Uh, my name's Alex Borstein, and I do your voice on the show. Are you saying the rough-edged comedy manager from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel does my voice? <laughs> I'm so honored! I love that show! You are hilarious! Yeah, Seth Green already did this bit. While the idea is interesting, the execution ultimately makes it fall flat. Number 9. The 2,000-Year-Old Virgin as if the first appearance of Jesus wasn't risky enough, the show decided to bring him back, this time in a much different light. Peter, listen, I've found the woman who I'd like to lose my virginity to. It's someone who understands me and someone I feel very close to. Oh, wow, Jesus, that's great! Hey, is it Carrie Underwood? Somebody told me you guys went out once. Yeah, we did, but it was a disaster. The Son of God is portrayed as a manipulative creep, which numerous people find to be out of line. He manages to convince Peter that Lois is the only woman good enough for him, and Peter reluctantly agrees. However, it's quickly revealed that Jesus does this annually, and constantly finds new couples to manipulate. Even after Jesus is called out, the deity simply explains it away as a test. Oh, so it was a test. Like when your father told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yes, that. That's exactly right. Uh, well, I can see my work here is done. The ending feels rushed, and the story fizzles out instead of being properly settled. While there are some funny bits, the controversy surrounding the religious figure's depiction took center stage. Number 8. Turban Cowboy We're not sure what the writers were thinking with this one. After a skydiving accident, Peter is hospitalized, where he befriends a man named Mahmoud. As they become closer, Peter decides to convert to Islam. Things go wrong almost instantly when Peter unknowingly joins a sleeper cell that has the intention of destroying a bridge in Quahog. Who is better, Hulk Hogan or the Iron Sheik? Um, the Iron Sheik? Okay, he is one of us. The jabs feel intentionally mean-spirited compared to past gags about religion. The backlash was swift, with multiple critics calling it Islamophobic. The poorly timed Boston Marathon joke, which aired only a month before an actual attack on the race, did not help. It was a disappointing route for them to go down, considering how interesting it could have been to see the family learn about other cultures. So what happens next? Do those guys all get trials? Well, you know, some of them. It's, uh, it's, it's a song. It's the process. Whatever. Number 7. Peter Rassment This show isn't exactly known for its hard-hitting commentary. In an attempt to shine a light on the harassment of men in the workplace, they wrote an episode about Peter being sexually harassed by his then-boss, Angela. Yeah, this is gonna work out just fine. <laughs> Excuse me. They do touch on some double standards, like how men being victimized by women is taken less seriously. However, any cogent point they make is immediately erased when they completely absolve the perpetrator of any wrongdoing. Griffin? I haven't been with anyone in 10 years, and when you spurned my advances, it was a wake-up call. No one's ever gonna love me again. Wait a minute. So that's why you've been acting like such a wacky ass around me? Eventually, Peter is essentially guilted into sleeping with Angela to prevent her from taking her own life. The lack of justice, although realistic, is disheartening. The audience couldn't help but feel like the ending was bleak, and found the whole story to be uncomfortable. Everything worked out perfect. Not really, Peter. Yeah, you cheated on your wife. No, I didn't. I used Mort. Oh my god, I forgot about Mort. I want my two dollars! Number 6. Quagmire's Dad This installment of the series is primarily known for having aged like milk. 
After meeting Glenn's parent, the guys are shocked when she comes out as Ida, a trans woman. After her surgery, the rest of the characters proceed to misgender her and mock her to her face and behind her back. I made a crumble! Ah, oh, how thoughtful! Throw it away in the outside garbage. Even Brian, who had slept with her post-surgery, vomits upon learning the truth. The reaction from everyone feels incredibly overblown, and it makes the viewing experience uneasy. It's a needlessly cruel episode about an already marginalized community, and many viewers feel that it's punching down far too much. Listen, I, I feel awful about the things I said last night. While Ida is treated more kindly now, it's hard to forget her introduction. Number 5. Fresh Air All right, here comes the meteor-sized ball drop. Collectively, the worst part about this episode is all the uncomfortable jokes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not supposed to be doing this. From Carter giving his grandson, um, a hand, to Peter attempting to marry his son, one may notice the absence of laughter and the rise of sounds like ooh and ooh, wow. I don't, I don't know what to do now. Feel that chill down your spine? That's your brain trying to escape your body and hide from this episode. So Peter tries to marry Chris so that he can steal the money that Carter left to him. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled. Now, I ain't no scholar, but if that's not a metaphor for Major League butt stuff, I don't know what is. Pay attention to this recipe, people. One cup of ugly motivations and a whole lot of awkwardness make for a perfectly terrible episode. Number 4. Herpy the Love Sore From babies getting pregnant to babies getting herpes, this Family Guy episode sets a new low for the series. Brian and Stewie become blood brothers, but Brian fails to mention to his infant friend that he has herpes. This causes Stewie to get the disease too, and after some pitiful attempts at revenge, the two end up reconciling. Brian tells Stewie that the reason he didn't tell Stewie about the herpes was that he was embarrassed. And as if that was an acceptable excuse, Stewie forgives him and just accepts the fact that he has herpes for the rest of his life now. All right, no more. Just talking about this episode makes one need a shower. What the hell do you guys want from me? I want to drive your Prius to the end of the block all by myself. That's it? Yes. Okay. Yay! Number three, Seahorse Seashell Party. This one's a doozy, drawing bad ideas from the others on this list. Bang, bang! I'm gonna finger bang you, Chris! <laughs> Not if I finger bang you first, Dad! It's a bottle episode with more drama than comedy that focuses yet again on emotional mistreatment. Yeah, shut up, Meg! No! You shut up, Chris! I am sick of all you guys ganging up on me! While we have to give Meg some kudos for finally standing up for herself, she completely goes back on it all by deciding to be the family's martyr. Maybe if I feel bad, they don't have to. We get that Family Guy likes to make taboo jokes and take controversial angles, but the ending pretty much communicates that people in toxic relationships should stay there. And there's nothing funny about that. You guys, I have something to say. You're right. It's all my fault. Number two, Stewie is enceinte. This is a nine months pregnant sized ball drop. What we mean by that is in this episode, Stewie gets pregnant. I think I'm gonna throw up. Taking his implied obsession with his friend Brian to a whole new level, Stewie uses some scientific mumbo jumbo to impregnate himself using Brian's DNA. While that is certainly a visual we never asked for, the babies they produce are even worse. It all caps off with them leaving the abominations at a local animal shelter and everything returning to normal. But it'll never be normal again, will it? Some sights can never be unseen, no matter how many times you wash your eyes. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Screams of Silence – The Story of Brenda Q do you know what Family Guy, the cartoon featuring an evil mastermind baby and a talking dog, needs? A serious story about abuse, of course. This episode is littered with head-shaking moments, like the scene between Quagmire's sister and her husband that everyone in the neighborhood is able to hear. Did you change the channel while I was going to get a beer? Oh yeah, I I'm sorry honey, I just wanted to see who was on Letterman. It's a scene that plays out in excruciating detail, and one that just makes you wince and ask, why? While the episode ends on a positive note for Brenda Quagmire, it teaches the audience that the best way to deal with abuse is revenge and ultimately murder. You know, classic comedy. It's a little rough, Peter. I didn't write it, Joe did. Did you enjoy this video? 
check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.